Okay, so as I mentioned before, Swipple um, is initials for songs, wordplay, and letters. Often in pre-K for me, you'll see an N at the end, which is for numbers. So sometimes we'll refer to it as Swipple, and sometimes we'll refer to it as Swiplin. Um, it just depends. And then also today we're going to discuss the math components. So I had mentioned briefly before, and just as a reminder, um, in the pre-K for me curriculum, unlike OWL, we wrote math right into it. Um, so there's no need to have a supplemental math curriculum if you're using pre-K for me. Lots of other schools that are using OWL um, or any other curriculum for that matter also have a supplemental math program. For example, they might use building blocks, they might use everyday math. Um, there's a variety of different ones that I've uh, seen implemented in pre-K. Um, but if you're going to fully adopt pre-K for me, there's no need for any other pieces. So we'll spend the first time to get a hour or so talking specifically about Swipple, and then I'll switch gears and talk about math. You'll see how they um, somewhat align, so it won't be night and day, um, but I do just want to focus on one part and then the other. So that's going to be my, my plan here. So the reason for Swipple, uh, Swipple, those of you that are using OWL, this is going to be really familiar for you. Um, the reasons that we want to focus on this specific component of the curriculum for these reasons, right? So during your Swipple activities, you're going to be explicitly teaching these pieces. Letter name knowledge, the alphabetic principle, print conventions, book handling, oral vocabulary, etc. So all of these instructional content is really specific during Swipple time. Of course, it's integrated throughout other parts of your day, in centers, in read aloud, um, in your general interactions with students, but this portion of the curriculum is really focused on these pieces. And of course, when we have math integrated into it, that's where the N, the numbers, and those components come in. Okay, but for the most part, we're talking about these specific pieces, okay, and being really intentional and really explicit around them. So we know that children who enter preschool with what we call word poverty, meaning that they've not been exposed to large vocabularies, there's, um, they've not been exposed to lots of conversations, to word play or high quality interactions, those children need to be explicitly and intentionally taught phonological awareness, okay? So phonological awareness, we say, and those of you who know Musu Reed, um, she always says phonological awareness can be done in the dark, okay? It's not about seeing a letter or seeing a shape. It's not about the visual part of language. Phonological awareness is the audio part. It's what you hear a sound in a letter. It's what you hear in a voice and what you're hearing being read to you, what you're hearing being sung to you, that phonological awareness can be done in the dark. So if we're in a room and the lights are out and I say, but you're gonna know that that's the letter B because you're an adult, you've been instructed on this, you know that B says, but, okay? <clears throat> that's what we're explicitly and intentionally teaching um, when we talk about phonological awareness. So when children have phonological awareness and letter ID, right, two very different things. When children have both of those, then they can learn the alphabetical principle, which is the concept that letters represent sounds, okay? Letters represent sounds. That's the alphabetical principle that we know children can learn with phonological awareness and letter ID. So those are two pieces that are gonna be discussed during Swivel. Okay, so just as soon as you start, or just start as soon as most of the children at Circle. So Swipple in Pre-K for Me is a whole group activity. Okay, so regardless of where you have it scheduled in your day, you're not gonna have it scheduled back to back with another whole group, of course, because that would be too long. But typically I see this done, and those of you that are on here that do this, please speak up and comment on when you have Swipple organized or scheduled in your day. Typically I see it in the afternoon, um, often either after lunch and before rest or after recess and before rest. Sometimes I'll see it in the afternoon after rest, okay? So you've done all of your morning routines. 
And then Swipple is typically a large part of, or not a large part, but um, a piece of the afternoon. So others that are using this in your classrooms, whether it's through OWL or through Pre-K for Me, when do you find that you schedule Swipple? Yeah, so I see that. Go ahead with that. Are you reading the chat also? So um, Jamie says after nap, Kelly says after lunch. For Nicole. Morning for Nicole. Yeah. Yeah, so it's not, you know, I'm not going to tell you exactly when to do it, but just be mindful that it is another whole group activity. Um, you're looking at another 12 to 15 minutes of whole group for this. Uh, so just be mindful when scheduling that, that you're not doing it back to back with um, another long whole group activity. Before lunch, that's a great one too, yeah. So the idea here being that when it's time for Swipple, when you've gathered your children's attention and you've transitioned them to the whole group, just start. As soon as most of the children are there, just get going. Um, so if they're cleaning up from lunch or transitioning from um, centers or coming in from outside, just announce it's time for Swipple, come to the rug, and then get going, okay? So we want the children to learn that something interesting is going to happen when you start talking, okay? So you're at whole group, the majority of your students are at whole group, and you've begun. Welcome to Songs, Word, Play, and Letters. Our first activity will be a song, okay? So the goal here being not to reinforce negative behavior by waiting for everyone to be quiet. Okay, we want to reinforce positive behavior by starting with the fun stuff. So you've got a majority of your kiddos there, they're ready to go, go. Okay. The other important thing to remember during Swipple is to label the activity. So tell them what you're doing. We're going to be doing a song. Next, we'll do a poem. This is a finger play. This is going to be a word game or a guessing game, a clue game. Okay, label that for them. Identify what it is they're doing and it's going to change so every swipple lesson oh i sorry every swipple group time you do a variety of these things right it's not just a poem and that's it or not just a song and that's it you're going to do a song and a poem and maybe a predictable story okay so label that for them when you're doing it any questions or thoughts around that before i move on Okay, so I wanted to show you quickly um, on the website on Pre-K for Me where you can find the Swipple um, activities. So there's a few things here that I want to make sure I highlight, and that is the Swipple books. So just a moment ago, I mentioned that in some of the Swipple activities, you might do a predictable text. These are different than the read aloud stories. So when you're preparing for the week or preparing for a unit, obviously you need the read aloud stories. Those are key but you're also gonna to wanna to double check the Swipple books because that's a whole nother set of text that you're gonna to wanna to make sure you have ahead of time and that you've read ahead of time and that you are familiar with as the, the leader of the lesson, okay? So I'll show you where you can find those. And then we're gonna uh, look quickly at where the Swipple is on the Pre-K for Me site. It's not as obvious, it's a little uh, hidden or can be hidden if you're not used to navigating that. Um, and then, of course, the lesson plans and the resources. So hopefully, can you see this uh, main Department of Ed, the home web page? I can't see anybody because I blocked everybody's thing. Yes, okay, I saw, thank you. <laughs> I saw your thumbs up, perfect. I have to hide my video so that it doesn't block anyone. Okay, so when you're on the main DOE site, just like always, you're under teaching and learning, you'll access early childhood education. And this will bring you to all of our um, site's content. And for today's purposes, we're talking about pre-K for me. Um, and while that loads, I was able to get the unit six site uh, links up. There's a few that are dead links, so I'm working with our tech guy to edit those. But for the most part, unit six is up and ready. And you'll remember, I use Google Chrome, um, so it, the pictures show up all wonky. If you're using the Internet Explorer one, it should come out nice and symmetrical. So I apologize for the visual there. 
Um, okay, so Swipple material and book list. You're gonna look under, I personally think the best spot to go is under additional curriculum resources, about halfway down the Creaky For Me page. And you'll see this visual book inventory for units one through six. So this is gonna be your best spot to go to prepare um, the books that you're gonna need for the units. So you'll see once it loads, it has the unit one family core read aloud. So these are the books that you need for the read aloud when we do the multiple reads. And then below that is the supplemental text. So you'll need these books sometimes for let's find out about it, which we'll talk about later in the week. And some of them you need for a swivel. Okay, so these are just visual book covers. Um, I'm sure some of them might be new, others are classics, right? Like Brown Bear, Brown Bear, Time for Bed. There's another one in another unit um, that's another familiar one. So these are some more supplemental texts that you'll need to be used in some of the math lessons. And they're recommended for the outdoor learning piece as well, if you incorporate the outdoor learning. Okay, and then as you scroll down, it'll go through the units. So unit two core read alouds, and then the supplemental text for let's find out about it in Swivel. Okay, so there's that piece. And then where is Swivel on the site? So once you're on the pre-K for me, depending on which unit you're in, we've been talking about unit four, so I guess it'll just make sense to stick with that. So unit four, World of Color, when I click on the picture, it'll bring me right to all of the links needed for unit four. So the first thing you'll notice in each one is that the songs, wordplay, letters, and numbers, Swiffle or Swifflin, the resources for those are always at the top of each unit, okay? You'll access it here as needed, depending on which week you're in. So if you're a full day program, you most likely have Swivel planned every day. If you're a half day program, this might be one of the components that you don't do every day, but you're gonna wanna incorporate it at least two or three times a week, I would think. So you'll pop open your schedule. Here's a full day schedule. And as you scroll down, you'll notice that for Swivel, it just says refer to clipboard directions, okay? It doesn't have it listed out day by day in the unit or week by week in the unit. So instead of accessing what lesson you're doing there, you'll need to scroll down when you're back in the unit four main page there. And you'll see it listed as one of the um, columns on the, on the left. So here's Swiplin. So unit four, week one. And this will open up a lesson plan for me. And you'll notice that it says day one. So this is what you'll do on day one. You'll do five green and speckled frogs, right? Everybody knows that song, which is a song, so you'll label it that way. You'll do the snowman, which I believe is a poem. You'll do this game, if your name ends with whatever letter, raise your hand. Okay, and I'll go through these a little bit more in just a minute, I'm just showing. You'll do apples and bananas. And you'll do alphabet memory pocket check game. Okay, and then on day two, so I'm just scrolling down that one lesson plan. On day two, here's your layout. And as you go through, you'll come to day three, which I just passed quickly. You'll come to day four, etc. Okay. So if your lesson plan called for a poem, so in that one, I believe it was the snowman. You'll notice here at the top, under songs, wordplay, letters, and numbers, under poems, is the snowman. So if you don't already have this as a large poster in your classroom, you can just refer to it on you know, this resource and print it out. I know a lot of teachers like to have the visual piece for students. So if, where some of these have come from OWL, if you've done OWL, you might already have the poem on the nice big poster size chart. If not, and you're crafty, um, and you might want to rewrite this onto a nice big chart so that when you're reading it to the students, you can point out the words and point out the pictures. Okay, but every poem that you're gonna need um, is gonna be here at the top. Okay, so you'll have hands on shoulders, peas, porridge, hot, 
The Little Turtle, and The Snowman. Those are all the poems for Swipple and Unicorn. Some of the activities are flannel board pieces. So if you're wanting to print out the flannel boards, the, there's some visuals here. Certainly don't have to use these ones, but depending on the story, um, you know, you'll want to have something. If you're artsy and if you have these already created out of flannel, then great. If not, you can just cut these out and stick them on a piece of flannel and be done. And then another big part of Swipple is the clue games which we'll talk about more so in a minute too, but this is where you'll find those. Okay, any questions on that? All good? Okay, so some of the swivel activities. So, I mentioned poems, I mentioned felt board stories. There's some predictable books. There's songs, familiar songs that I don't think any of you would be, um, you know, new to. If any of them are new to you and you're not sure of the tune or the speed, then certainly reach out to me. Um, I know a lot of them are likely available on YouTube or some type of a web based that way. Um, a lot of the songs you may already have on CD just from other children friendly music. That's great. My only heads up around that is, is typically when you're listening to a song on a CD, it can be really fast. Uh, so just be mindful of how fast it is. If you're singing it aloud to them, also be mindful of how fast you're going. Don't assume that your students have heard these songs before and are familiar with them, okay? The slower you go, if it feels awkward and slow to you, then you're probably doing it just right. <laughs> Um, because you want them to hear the sounds you're making, hear the flow of the music, and sing along with you. If you're going too fast, then those pieces can be lost. I want to point out, I know with OWL anyway, I think the general rule of thumb is to use the CDs and use the YouTube videos to learn the song and the tune, but not to be shared with the children. So when you're doing the songs, you're actually doing the singing, doing the tunes, and it's not coming from a CD. Perfect. I think that's a great, great point. Yes. Okay, great. Um, and then the letter and name games. So those are always fun, too. In the beginning of the year, you'll see, and actually I'll show you. So for example, in the beginning of the school year in unit one, which is family. And when I scroll down to Swiffle, the letter name games is one of the first activities you'll do. So for unit one, week one, you'll see the song is if you're happy, right? If you're happy and you know it. So here's an example of a name game. If your name starts with, name a letter, raise your hand, okay? So this is the procedure. You, the teacher, will say, we're going to play a game with our names. I'm going to hold up a letter like this. So you might hold up a letter card, right? So if it was me, I'd hold up the letter N. If your name starts with N, raise your hand. My name starts with N, so I'm raising my hand. Okay, and then show your name card, point out the first letter, right? So now I'm showing them the name Nicole, and I'm showing how the first letter is N, okay? So now they're able to make that visual connection that what I mean by the first letter is this, and this is what it is, and I'm raising my hand because it applies to me, right? So if a child's name starts with the letter, they can raise their hand. So if I have a child in my class named Nicholas, and he's not raising his hand, then I might say, Nicholas. Your name starts with N, so you can raise your hand, right? And then make sure you do that so that you have a letter for every child's name. So everybody on unit one, week one, gets a turn with this. As this rolls out over time, not everybody will get a turn, necessarily. And you'll start adding um, other pieces, right? So it might be if your name ends with this letter, okay? As they get used to it, you'll move on to sounds. If your name starts with the sound, or here we go. 
uh, this is on day two if you're happy. If your name starts with the sound n or b or p, okay? So, but that's gonna roll out over time. That's not on day one. But that's just an example of what we mean by letter and name games, okay? And then the clue games. So the clue games are fun. This is a very popular one in Swipple that I've seen. Clues should always follow in the order and give one at a time. So the first clue you're gonna give is just a general clue. The second clue is gonna be tied directly to a book that you've read. And the third clue is a phonological clue. Okay, so keeping that in mind, I'll show you what we mean. Sorry, Gal, what are Unit 4? So in Unit 4, right, World of Color, here's the clue game, and here's the descriptions. So during Swipple, when it says you're gonna play a clue game, if this is already done for you, there's nothing you need to make up, right? So when talking about jam, you'll remember that in the story Dog's Colorful Day, a spot of red jam fell on him. So you're gonna also want, let me go back here. There's visuals for each of these. So you'll start off by saying, you know, now we're gonna play a clue game. And you're obviously not gonna show them the picture yet. You're gonna have it hidden and you're gonna describe it. You'll say, this is a kind of food that is very sweet. We make this food from fruit and we eat it on toast or muffins. Okay, so that's your first general clue. Okay, you might have one or two students raise their hands, you might not. The next clue is gonna be tied to the book. So a red kind of this food fell on dog's coat when he stood under the breakfast table. Okay, so there's your second one. Your third one will be a phonological clue. The name of this kind of food starts with j, j, okay? And then see what you get. So once students get it correct, then you'll turn it around and say, yes, it was jam, okay? The next one is gonna be a stain, again, connected to Dog's Colorful Day. And there's a picture clue for stain. Okay, so again, when we get a general clue, when we get a colored spot of something on our clothes, we sometimes say that our clothes have one of these. Okay, the next clue is a book clue. Grass made one of these spots on dog's coat. And then the third one, your phonological clue. The first two sounds in this word are and t, st, and the word rhymes with rain, okay? And then see what you get, and hopefully they'll guess stain. Okay, and then they go on throughout. So for every bolded word here, there's um, a color resource picture to go with it, to present to the students after they've guessed it, or if they're having trouble guessing, um, then showing it at the end. Any questions or thoughts around the clue game? Okay. So there's one question in the chat. Sue's asking if there's guidance in pre-K for me when a student gives an incorrect answer. Um, good question, Sue. I don't know that there's necessarily written guidance in any of our documents that I know of, um, but I would love to sort of have an open conversation about that. What would you do if you're giving a clue and a student gives an incorrect answer? What are other teachers doing? What's your strategy around that? Hi, it's Sue. I'm not on screen because I'm having a very bad hair day. <laughs> um, but hi, everyone. Um, I'll just chime in. I know from OWL there, you know, we had a lot of training from um, Judy Shigadance, just trying to get at where the misunderstanding is. Um, and, you know, depending on the learner, it might be an uh, English language learner who just doesn't have the vocabulary. It might, need, it might be a student who just is completely off the mark and just wants to talk and share whatever pops into his or her brain 
<laughs> um, and so I think, you know, the um, order of the clues matters, but also the response um, to what the child is misunderstanding or misperceiving matters too, mm -hmm. um, just as much probably as the clues you're giving. Um, and you know, you all can imagine it's typically the same group of kids that are going to answer every time. Um, so it's trying to help those kids who are misunderstanding or never getting it right to move along <laughs> the developmental progression so they so that they're they're improving in their ability to right so sue you answered your own question <laughs> well i i just i was asking really specific to pre-k for me because i'm not as familiar as i am with l and um you know no just... i think you hit the nail on the head all those reasons and it goes back to i think um a question i was going to pose around what if the students guess it on the first clue right you give your general clue and they get it then what Right, so I'd be curious to know, I, I, I feel like I know what I would do if I was in the classroom, but that doesn't mean it's the right or wrong thing to do. So I was curious if your students are guessing it early or quickly, or to your point, Sue, the same students are guessing it again and again, then what? I mean, for me, I would absolutely show the rest of the clues or give the rest of the clues so that everyone who probably wouldn't have gotten it with the first clue mm -hmm. as an opportunity to fully digest and understand. But, but again, I think it depends a lot on who your range of learners are. Yeah. So there are a few answers also in the chat. Um, see if I can find them all. Um, acknowledge the attempt, ask them to ask a friend for help, problem solve together, um, saying, oh, I see why you could think that, or I see why you guessed that. Um, it's easier if it's somewhat connected. Sometimes their answers are completely unconnected, but they may say, oh, I can see why you thought that. This is an animal, but not the one I was thinking of. Um, if it's not connected, the go-to is, wow, nice thinking, but that wasn't what I was thinking of this time. Um, and I also want to add that if it's a letter, like rhyming letter, sound, that sort of thing, it's also very important to say if, if so if taking the stain for example the st sound if they're like give a totally off the wall you could say you know like a say they said paper like p you would maybe say something along the lines of um giving them the p sound and say well we were talking about the st sound like you know that sort of thing mm -hmm. and showing, showing them the difference between the two right um and sharing all the clues, I think, is a great idea. Even if they guess it, you know, yes, that's a great answer. You know, turn the thing around and or turn the picture around and give them the rest of the clues, so everybody else, like Sue said, can can um, follow that along. And Jenny also has a question. Uh, oh, about giving the three clues prior to getting any response from children. Um, and another tool that I would throw out there is having children instead of just yelling out answers because if ever if the same children we know they're getting the we know they're understanding it and we know they're getting it if other children are not you could call on the children who are not that sort of thing right yeah and i agree with what renee said too i think that's a great strategy so if you're giving your general clue and the students are guessing it for example the jam one right saying oh that's a great guess let's see if that will answer the next question to the next clue too right so then you give your book clue and you might turn back to that child and say, so the first time you guessed jam, do you think that's the same answer for the second clue, right? And asking that, and just being sure that if the majority of your students guess it correctly or agree that a guess is the correct answer, then yeah, you might be able to show it your visual aid before you've given all the clues, but then say your other clues, right? So like, wow, all of you think it's jam, and then show the picture, it is jam. My second clue was going to be, dog got this on his coat under the kitchen table at breakfast. Was that jam? And then recalling that. Um, if one or two students guess jam on your first clue and the rest don't agree or aren't sure, then don't show the picture quite yet. Go to the next book clue and say that and then sort of gauge where the students are at right and then if there's any misunderstandings or to Sue's point and to um, Marcy's point if they're guessing just um, 
incorrect answers or they're just guessing for the sake of guessing without actually making a connection, then really taking the time to explain what you mean by these clues and ex explain that you're looking for, you know, a logical answer um, to what it could possibly be. Any other questions before we move on to math, I believe is next, yes it is. So I know the website and the units, is a, it's a little funky, a little different setup for Swivel, the way it, it's organized. Um, but there's just so many resources between the color clues, I'm going fast, sorry, between the clue game and the flannel board and the poems, that to squeeze all those into these smaller boxes made it look really messy um, and disorganized. So that's why I separated it out to have um, all of them available in one place but the lesson plan is still below. Okay, does that make sense? And you'll notice that um, as we get into the math part of it, some of the math activities are done in large group. That can be looped into your swivel time, I think. Um, I'd be curious to know how that works in some of your classrooms, um, but we'll, we'll look through that. Okay. Can I also point out real quick, um, I know that you know 10 to 15 or 12 minutes, especially at the beginning of the year is a really long time for some students or some groups. And so I think the general rule of thumb is if you are modifying, sorry, I have animals all over me. If you're modifying for your group because they're just not ready to interact or sit still in a large group setting for that long, it's really important that you don't take out the literacy and letter sound activities. So if you take out a song or two, to shorten the time, just remember that all of the letter sounds, rhyming, literacy activities, they're foundations and they're building on the next weeks and the next days. So those are really important to keep in there if you if you need to modify. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And another thing too, we like to remind teachers of during poems is if you're familiar with the poem, then or let me rephrase that. The more familiar you are with the poem, the better, right? So what we don't want is teachers printing out these, um, you know, paper size versions and having them in front of them like this as we read it to the students, right? So hands on shoulders, hands on knees, hands behind you, if you please. Now your hair and now your toes, right? So that's not interactive. Right? Your students aren't seeing you, they're seeing the back of your notepad, right? So the more familiar you can become with these and the more you can recite them, not off the top of your head certainly, but having some form of a visual aid that you can refer to here and there, or some teachers will even post it large and put it behind the students so that they can see it, but the students can't necessarily see what you're looking at. Um, Personally, that would be harder for me, but I know some teachers that do it and they say it works well for them. The bigger point being not to be like this, right? Not to have the students see you constantly referring to a lesson plan or constantly referring to a poem instead of interacting with them, okay? And the other thing around reciting poems is, again, the importance of reading it ahead of time and learning sort of the, the flow of it and knowing where those rhyming words are where to stop and take a pause, um, where to make note, and the lesson plan will point this out as well, but just point being, getting really comfortable with what's expected during this time when you recite the poem. So this one you'll see is an interactive one, right? So you probably have students stand up and do the hands, oops, <laughs> hands on shoulders, hands on shoulders, hands on knees, etc. Um, and other ones won't be, other ones will be them sitting, listening, just to you recite the poem. And it might feel fast and it might feel pointless, but it's, it's truly not, right? So the, the better you are at reciting it and the better um, they're at, at listening to the different annotation of the poems, um, the more enjoyable it will be. But some activities I know feel like, okay, we're done with that, now this, we're done with that, now this. Um, just sort of have to, to go with it and just prepare yourself um, for those transitions between them. Okay, so I'm going to move on to the pre-K for me math. Oops. Um, this was written between um, a pre-K teacher that we contracted with as well as a UMaine math professor. So the two of them uh, got together, reviewed the various different units that we have pre-K for me, 
and aligned lessons that, again, have a very clear scope and sequence. We do them in order um, and integrated it throughout the curriculum. So let me make this a little bigger for you. Okay, so how is math learned in pre-K for me? It's very exper experiential and hands-on learning. So you'll see that math is done within other lessons, within other components of the curriculum, okay? It's not its own set scheduled part of the day. So you'll notice on the week by week access for or week by week schedules, whether you're full day or part day, and it'll say read aloud, centers, lunch, recess. It's not gonna say math. Okay, the math is integrated and written into those other components. Okay, it is still intentional. It is still very obviously there. It's just not its own set time like other grades have writing time or math time or reading time. Math is throughout the day, but very purposeful. Okay, it's multi-sensory and has diverse experiences. Okay, again, it's purposeful purposefully integrated across the curriculum, okay? So you'll find it during manipulatives. You'll find it in a science center or in science lessons. You'll see it during read aloud. You'll use it during library and listening. And of course, like we always say, you'll utilize math components through purposeful interactions with your students, okay? Some of the lessons are intentionally meant to be done in a whole group or a large group setting, okay? This is typically, like I was saying, alongside Swipple. So your Swipple activities might be 10, 12, 15 minutes, and then you might add on one more math activity while you have all the students there, right? So it's like another three, four, five minute activity. Nothing too, too extensive. Might even be a book. And then most often, the specific lesson plans that you'll see on the website are done during small group time. So we talked about small group, uh, not last week, the week before, and how there's typically three separate sections, right? There's a, um, an independent group, there's a high support group, and a medium support group. You'll see that these math activities are integrated into either the high support or the medium support groups. Okay. So... I'll stick with unit four. And again, similar to Swipple, as you scroll down, you'll see math is its own section on the left here. And here's a large group activity. Um, and one of the small groups that should actually be separated out, but that's okay, do that later. Um, and a, a second small group activity. And you'll see how that is played out throughout the unit. Okay, so where you'll notice it the most is when you're looking at the schedule and you'll likely find it during small groups. Okay, so this component of your day. So you'll see that on this particular one, that again, this is unit four, week one, your group one high support group is gonna be a literacy group. So you'll find the lesson for that up in small group. Your group two low support is a math one, okay? You're gonna be doing sticky dot pictures. So you'll find the lesson plan for sticky dot pictures under math. So small group, sticky dot pictures. Okay, and here's your lesson plan for that. Again, like all the others, it tells you what your essential questions are, okay? What concepts you're gonna be looking at, what materials you'll need, some specific math vocabulary, preparation, and procedure. So where this is a low support group during small groups, you're likely gonna have um, perhaps a volunteer. If you have an ed tech, this might be your ed techs group that they oversee. Um, so those are the people that you're gonna wanna make sure are prepared for this lesson, right? Of course, the lead teacher is gonna know what's happening because there's a, a level of expectation that they know what's going on, of course. But the adult that's leading the small group is the one that's really gonna to need to review this and see um, what it is the activity is uh, doing. If there's a resource needed, then that will be there as well. 
Oh, that was just a second. Okay, never mind. I guess that was my resource. The other thing I wanted to show you was similar to Swipple. Um, again, math has various books that it integrates into some of its lessons, and that's back on the main Pre-K for Me webpage. Okay, you'll see, um, you can find it under visual book inventory, but I have separated out the specific math resources. So there's various different tools here that you can use. There's some um, communications that you could send home to families, okay, and then there's some resources for additional math. The other thing with that, let me see if I put it on here. Um, yes, so units two, five, and six. I don't know why those units necessarily, but um, so unit five is shadows and reflections. You'll notice on those units under the math on the side here, there's an overview. So this is great for families. It's obviously great for teachers and their your ed tech support. Um, oh, of course, that's a dead link. Okay. Let me go back. Um, but it's also great for your curriculum coordinators in your schools or your administration. Um, if they're wanting to know what you're doing for math and uh, what your current areas of study in math are, then the math overview um, is a great handout for that. So I'll have to make a note that unit five is the dead link. Okay. Um, so this is just a resource for you to have. It's not anything that you necessarily need to print out and use for the lesson. Um, it's just there if you need it. The other part that's often there. <laughs> is a books and materials list. Hopefully that works. Nope, that's a dead link too. Why is it doing that? Sometimes at the bottom, not at this one. So there's um, extensions at the bottom too. It just depends on where they would fit into the site. But there's um, some information around using games to teach math some information around parts and holes, and the materials and books for, this is unit four. Okay, so those resources exist. Um, they're not as easily navigated in each unit. Um, and as you saw, some of them are dead links. I don't know if that's because I'm on Google Chrome or why not, but I've got a note, so we'll follow up on that. Any questions thus far on your the math implementation? The math you'll see too has a ton of resources that you can access if you want to. Um, they're meant to enhance the game. So for example, um, in this game, there's this printout that you can use. If you have a different grid with a dog that you'd prefer, that's fine. The idea being that it aligns with um, helping dog matches spots with this lesson plan. I see in the chat. So, um, <clears throat> Lynn has asked, how should math fit into half day programs? So it definitely needs to be a part of a half day program. Of course, you can't just negate the math altogether. Where it's specifically written into the majority being small group activities, and that's something you'll just need to be mindful of, it might mean that if you don't have time to do small group, that component fully, then you might have to pull the math pieces out so that those are happening more often. Um, or the other idea being, going through and looking at what the math activities are and incorporating them into your center's time. Um, you could make, you know, centers has a manipulative activity that's often given. You could also add a math activity so that students are exploring those. Centers is more child driven, so it doesn't mean that that math activity is going to be met by every child though. So you'll have to just keep that in mind. Um, I'd be curious, Lynn, are you doing a supplemental math curriculum now 
Um, and are you finding time to fit that into your half day program? I'll get to your question, Renee, in just a minute. Oh, okay, yeah. So yeah, if you're not, or if you don't already have a, a supplemental math program, then adding math into your regular scheduled half day is going to be important. Um, the math in pre-K for me, like all the others, like I say, has a scope and sequence, right? So I wouldn't recommend that you come in and just browse through for something that you like. Um, I would definitely try to introduce the activities in the sequence that they are over time. <laughs> Go ahead, Marcy, were you going to say something? No, sorry. Okay. Um, but the idea being that you don't want, even in half day programs, it's hard to incorporate everything um, and be mindful of that. So I think your best bet would be um, incorporating a small group activity at least two or three times a week, depending on how often you're meeting. If it's half day, five days, and um, at least I would say two or three times. If it's half day, four days, and you might only get to small group once or twice. Um, but being really intentional around when you're doing math and being really explicit about that and those activities. Um, for your question, Renee, I saw around the two day a week programs. So our schedules don't um, offer that necessarily. So we have either, it's written for either a full day or part day. Full day being full day five week, ideally. Part day being half day five day, or yeah, half day five days a week, ideally. Um, anything above and beyond that, outside of those, you, you kind of just have to get fancy with. The two day a week schedule is a really tough one be, for consistency, right? Like I'm sure you already know that, regardless of what curriculum you're doing. That I don't know of any curriculum that's evidence based that meets fully the needs of programs that are only meet twice a week. And I'm willing to bet that your two days a week aren't um, back to back. There's probably like a, a Monday, Wednesday, Tuesday, Thursday, or something like that. Um, I tend to see that that a, a, can be a common model in Maine. Um, so it's hard. And it's something that you and I can have a conversation around outside of this or, um, to better clarify how it would look in that, those types of programs. But it's definitely going to be different. Um, your students are going to have a different experience with the curriculum than if they were in attendance um, more consistently throughout the week. You know, not impossible, um, just harder, for sure. Um, any other questions on that? I did just want to go back to the main Pre-K for Me page uh, to look at some of the math, additional math resources that are there. If, if you're implementing this and specific questions around math come up, I'm not going to pretend like I know all the answers to them. I didn't write the math piece. Um, the two women who we contracted with that did write the math piece are phenomenally communicable. So I'd be more than happy to get you in touch with them. Um, and they would be the best to answer any specific questions or the whys of some of the lessons. Um, and they were also the ones that supplied some of these additional um, tools and resources for folks. So these are some great tools that you could use when interacting with students during small groups um, or during centers or during a you know, large group if you can really do two things at once well um, and sort of just taking notes and, and seeing where students are at with some of the concepts that you're doing. Um, some of the, again, the books, um, go here, um, are ones that you may or may not be familiar with. They should all be current and available in publishing, um, also available through the main library system. Um, and you'll notice that those come up in um, small group and swivel activities. It's taking a Yeah, 
yeah, half day programs aren't always ideal for um, curricula. Again, I think most evidence based curriculum are meant to be implemented in full day programs, full day, full week. Um, so pre K for me and OWL and creative curriculum and tools of the mind, you know, those are all um, ones that would have to be tweaked to and modified um, to best fit what you've got going on for your program and the time you offer. And certainly Maine Winters offer an extended time, like you're saying here, Jenny, in the chat um, of getting ready. So, it, and, you know, it's one thing to, to modify it into a half day or to, into less than three or four hours a day it's just going to take some finessing, which, which is why I say, you know, reach out to us and let us know because if we don't expect you to um, to do that on your own, right? Like we would want teachers and programs to be interacting with each other and to be interacting with us around how best to implement it in what your program offers in terms of hours and days of the week. Um, I don't want it to be a guessing game for anyone or um, a stressor for anyone. I think that's probably another reason why a lot of teachers resort back to doing um, their own activities or creating their own lessons and creating their own schedules. Not that that's bad, it's just that um, that's not always an evidence-based approach. So it, it just is what it is. It's why the department wants to make sure and is hosting things, um, activities like this so that you know why we're here and what we wanna do in terms of support for you um, and support for your, for your students and for your co-teachers. Um, so that it can be the best implemented the best way possible. Grace makes a really good point in the chat also that some of these um, rhyming and letter sound activities can be planned into transition times, which mm -hmm. is very true. Yeah, a lot of the lessons in our lesson plans in whole group lesson plans for Swipple and math and um, read alouds, there's specific transition um, activities. So yes, definitely math is, is absolutely one of them. So I did want to post in the chat real quickly the link for certificates. So you should, whoops, I just sent it to Jen. Sorry, Jen, hold on. So if you copy and paste that, I tested it this morning and it seemed to work fine. And then whatever email I just put in will go directly to, um, the certificate will go directly to you there. Um, we have, Tomorrow is open office hours. And then on Wednesday, I realized I had never organized a time to talk about let's find out about it, another big uh, component piece of pre-K for me. Um, so on Wednesday at 10.30, we'll do let's find out about it. Yeah, uh, um, Elaine, I see your question there in the chat. I'll send you what you need for that. Any other questions for um, Swipple or Matt? Okay, I'll leave, um, I'm gonna mute myself and turn my camera off, but I'll still be here. So if anybody has any difficulty with that link for the certificate, um, just shout out and I'll um, help you to sort of navigate that. Otherwise, everybody, I will see you at another time. Have a great day. Lynn, I think you actually have to copy and paste the link into your browser. Yep, sometimes it comes through that way, but this time it's a, you have to copy and paste it.
Thanks, Marcy. <laughs> Nicole, can you actually speak to the other question? Do we do they need to pre-register for each time? I think so, but I'm not positive if the link will work. Yes, no, you need to register for each one. Another safety measure they've put on us. And it's really helpful when teachers use their um, school email because then I can see that you're coming from a school. Some of the Gmail or Yahoo accounts, I can't tell if it's actually an educator or not or somebody that this is going to be meaningful for in Maine. Um, just need to be careful of all hackers, of course, but um, we've had some media hop on as well. So we, do, we just need to make sure we're uh, mindful of who we're presenting to. Some names I know, so it's easier. But. Um, I see your your note in there, Sally. Let me double check. Sorry, I got cut off. Let me double check um, on my end. So Sally, I see that you responded and it looks all set on my end. So if it doesn't send to you, let me know and I'll make sure it gets forwarded. Hopefully it's not glitching again. Surely you're having trouble. Hmm, let me see why. So I'm just gonna paste the same link again. Shirley, is it, are you having trouble copying that link? Would you prefer if I email it to you? Oh, Lynn, I see that. Yes, I can email that to you. Hold on, let me write that down. So, Lynn, any luck, Shirley, on your end? Okay, Shirley, I've got an email and I'm drafted right now. I'll send it to you.
just sent it to you.